probability, the engine of inference. Get ready and some coffee, because if we want to get futuristic, we need statistics. First qu first a word from our sponsor. Yeah, uh, actually we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay whatever because our merchandise is is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like our trust me, I'm an accountant product line. Yeah, it's paramount that you let people know that you're an accountant because Apparently, we're among the only ones equipped with the number crunching skills to answer society's current deep, complex, and nuanced questions. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. Question What is probability? Probability is a branch of mathematics that deals with the likelihood or chance of different outcomes. It's a measure of how likely an event is to occur and is expressed as a number between zero and one. Therefore, we can think about probability as a subset or branch of mathematics. However, we want to think about the relationship between probability and statistics. Statistics also, in essence, being a branch of mathematics. Probability being used within statistics and can be thought of, in essence, as the driving force or engine when using statistics to do inductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning basically being when we know something about something and we're uh, trying to apply that more generally, which often takes the form of knowing something about a sample, which we would like to apply more generally to a population. Noting that when we do this type of analysis, we can never have complete confidence because we don't know everything about the entire population. We only know something about the sample. Probability then can help us to set up those types of experiments and also can give us some idea about the confidence level that we have when we apply the assumptions to an entire population. Probability is a measure of how likely an event is to occur and is expressed as a number between 0 and 1, which can also be expressed in percents, 0% to 100%. For example, if you flip a coin, you have, in essence, a 50-50 chance to get heads or tails, which adds up to 100%, 50 and 50, which can also be expressed as 0.5 versus 0.5, which adds up to 1. Common misconceptions. One reason it's useful to understand some concepts related to probability is because although our intuition, our gut is typically quite good leading us in the correct direction, it can be consistently fooled by some concepts related to probability. So what we would like to be able to do is identify those kinds of decisions where our gut might not lead us in the correct direction, putting together more formal decision-making processes for those types of decisions. It can be demonstrated many different ways how our intuition will consistently go wrong with certain concepts related to probability. Many magic tricks, for example, taking advantage of this concept. One area where our mind is often off is with the concept of randomness itself, a core concept within many areas of uh, probability, of course. So when we think about randomness in a coin flip, for example, if you asked someone to, to just write down randomly what you think the results of a coin flip would be, heads, tails, heads, tails, and so on and so forth, versus a computer generated uh, actual random list of heads and tails, then those two things typically do not look the same. For example, if you took a random generated test that was a true false test, and you had the computer just make a random generated true or false answer key versus a instructor that's trying to put randomness between the true and false answers, uh, which one of these lists are you likely to think is actually a random list versus the one that was constructed by a human being? And the one up top, most people would often think does not look like the random one because you have these long lists in this case just four in a row you could have longer than four in a row if you have a very long list of heads or tails 
or trues and false, you can have like strings of tens in a row that were actually randomly generated versus if a humor, human being is trying to replicate randomness, they will often space things out more evenly. You're not gonna find a string of longer than three or possibly four of trues or false or heads or tails in a row. So that's just a demonstration how in our intuition, what we typically do is we evenly space things out and think of that as random. But actual randomness often has more clumpiness involved in it. Things are closer together. You get these longer lists of items. Uh, that can also be demonstrated if you plot dots on a graph, for example, or if you try to sit people in a movie theater, uh, then if you tell them to sit randomly, what they will actually do is space out as opposed to true randomness where you end up with these clumps. People sitting right next to each other oftentimes would look more similar to true randomness oftentimes. Okay, now let's look at the concept of Pascal's wager explaining the basic premise. Now I'm going to warn you in advance that Pascal's wager has to do with God, which means that if you've heard about it at all, say in our American secular public school system, it's probably been talked about in a very dismissive type of fashion, which I don't think is very fair. Not because I think Pascal's wager is going to be convincing a lot of people about the existence of God, which isn't really even the reason for his argument, but rather because number one, his logic was sound and is still the logic behind some of the core concepts we use to be today in probability, that being the concept of expected value. And number two, I just think it's a really interesting origin story that this logical mathematical concept we use all the time today was first articulated with regards to an argument related to God. I think that's interesting. Also leads to another interesting thing related to my education, which I think is similar to a lot of people in the United States. And that is that when I was going to school, I was basically taught that religion and science are opposites. Basically, they don't uh, go together. However, all the things that they taught me that were science related, I later learned were discovered by people who were religious. And that always seemed like kind of a contradiction to me. How is that the case? And I think basically what ended up happening, this is my theory anyway, is that when the new scientific method came into play, what they wanted to do was rely less on ancient authority of like the Greeks and the theology, for example, and instead apply this inductive reasoning, thinking about what they know and how they can infer that to like the broader population using a scientific method. And anytime they defer to authority, that's going to be stopping them from continuing their scientific method because the argument would be, well, it's just that way because that's the way God made it or because that's how Aristotle said it was. So they started to adopt the heuristic of not doing that. We're not going to defer to authority, but we're going to look to proof about items within the natural world, which is a great heuristic when doing science that was applied by people that it looks to me like we're religious. But then later on, the scientific community, it looks to me, like they took that heuristic as though it was a religious truth rather than a practical heuristic. So the scientists, although they can't empirically prove the existence of God or not prove the existence of God, they took it as a religious kind of fact later on, it seems like, to become atheists because they kind of internalized that heuristic as though it was a fact. That's, that's my theory. That's my theory, in, in other words. Anyways, the argument is Pascal argues that when it comes to belief in God, humans are faced with a choice under conditions of uncertainty. So clearly when we hear conditions of uncertainty, we start to be thinking about probability. The idea being here that we cannot prove empirically. We cannot prove with science either the existence or the non-existence of God. Therefore, we have to make some kind of choice under the conditions of uncertainty, similar to when we flip a coin where we have a 50-50 outcome. Now, you might be saying, hey, look, I may not be able to prove the existence or the non-existence of God, but I think based on what I have seen, it's not a 50-50 likelihood. And so it's fine. You could say, okay, I'll give you that. It could be whatever the percentages they are, but we don't have complete certainty, of course, because we cannot empirically prove something 
outside the material world with basically things within the material world. We have no scientific proof for the existence or non-existence of God. That's going to be the basis of the argument. So we can either choose to believe in God or not believe in God. Now, you might say, hey, wait, I can step out of the game entirely and choose to be agnostic. I'm just not going to participate in the game. But his argument is, look, we're stuck here in life and we have to make some kind of decision about either the existence or non-existence of God. You have one or the other options generally is the basis of his argument. You're kind of stuck in the coin flip game, whether you think the coin is fair or not. So the wager does not attempt to prove God's existence. Rather, it suggests that it is in our best interest to believe in God given the potential outcomes. So he's not trying to present this as a proof of God. There are many other people that are trying to prove God. But, of course, you can't really do that with like a scientific method because you can't prove something about the immaterial with scientific proofs of the material world. At least we don't have any kind of concept of how to do that thus far. Therefore, we're left uh, with this uncertainty. So his argument is that it would be in our best interest which is usually when you're arguing against this argument, that's the line of attack. It's not on the logic of the argument. It's to say, hey, look, arguing on our best interest doesn't really convince me or isn't as satisfying to be thinking about whether God exists or not in the actual world. But we'll get to that shortly. So Pascal's wager can be broken down into the following matrix of outcomes based on belief and the actual existence of God. This matrix we can also break down when we're thinking about the same logic with regards to expected value, say if you're betting on a coin flip, for example. If you're betting on a coin flip, the things that you need to know to see whether or not you want to be participating in the game is what's the likelihood of the coin flip coming up to be your outcome. If you pick heads, what's the likelihood of it being heads, number one. And number two, what is going to be the payout if uh, heads comes up. So in other words, is it going to be a 50-50 payout? If you win, you get a dollar. If you lose, uh, you lose a dollar. And there, therefore, it would be an even game if it was an even coin. Uh, or possibly, what if you flip the coin and you get to win a million dollars, but if it comes up tails, you lose only a dollar. That would be a very favorable game. And therefore, you would most likely really want to play that game uh, because there's really only upside and there's very little that you can lose on the downside. And even if the coin wasn't fair, and this would be the argument similar to the argument that we had when we say, hey, look, I, if, if you're skeptical and you're saying, look, everything I see doesn't, I don't see God within it. And therefore, I'm going to give a very low probability about uh, the existence of God, even though I can't exactly prove it, then the question would be, well, what would have to be the payout in order for that to be a fair game if you look at it from the standpoint of probability? In other words, if I flip the coin and I only have a 5% chance of it coming out heads because it's an unfair coin and heads is what I need to win, then it could still be a fair game if I get paid like, if they're going to pay me a million dollars and I only lose $1 it still probably want to take that bet. If you flip the coin, there's only a 5% chance it comes out heads. But if it comes out heads, I win a million dollars. And if it doesn't, then I only lose a dollar, right? That's going to be part of the argument. Okay, so if God exists and you believe, you have an infinite gain, eternal happiness in heaven. So obviously you, you're stuck in this coin flip. You have to play the game. You can't really opt out because we're stuck here. And so the question is, well, you can choose to believe in God, in which case then if you win, you go to heaven, which is infinite life. So you get eternal happiness. That would be like you flip the coin and they give you infinite money on the payout. Instead of one to one, dollar to dollar, they pay you infinity dollars, right? <laughs> on the one side. So if God exists and you do not believe, infinite loss. So what if uh, you don't believe, you bet on the, on, on the negative, then on the losing side, you, you're going to be in hell is going to be the argument, right? So that means that's going to be very bad on the negative side. So if God does not exist and you believe, you have a finite loss, some loss of pleasure or resources. So in other words, if you basically say that, uh, that God exists and you believe, but that was wrong, you were incorrect in that belief, then what do you really lose? 
well, you could have been a hedonist all life. You could have been drinking and partying the whole time and whatnot. But even that, even the atheists these days uh, would are seem to be arguing that you would probably want to act as though there was a God and that's going to make you more happy than being a hedonist. But that would be the argument. You can say, well, I lose, th I lose that compared to the infinite gain. If God does exist and you do not believe, you have a, a finite gain, some gain of pleasure or resources in life. I got these last two mixed up. If God does exist, uh, if God does not exist and you believe, then you believed in something that doesn't exist, which possibly could have led to to some benefits in your life anyways, because it might lead you to make better decisions based on that information, even if it wasn't true, which again is kind of like the argument of the atheists these days, it seems like. If God does not exist and you, and you do not believe, you have a finite gain, some gain of pleasure or resources. So in other words, if God doesn't uh, exist and you do not believe, then you're allowed to be a hedonist or, or whatever. But again, that might not be beneficial or, or lead to the most happiness, whether God exists or not. So this would be the matrix that we have here. So we have belief or don't believe. So if we believe and God exists, then we have infinite gain. Uh, if we believe and God does not exist, then we only have really, we only lose a finite loss, right? If we, if we don't believe and God uh, uh, exists, then we have an infinite loss because now we're going to go to hell or whatever, right? And if we don't believe and God does not exist, we have a finite gain because that's when we can party it up and do whatever we want because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, matter. Although again, that possibly will not lead to the best life, even if you're an atheist, right? So, so Pascal argues that a rational person should choose to believe in God because the potential infinite gain outweighs any finite loss. The reasoning can be summarized as follows. So infinite gain versus finite loss. So that would be like, again, if we're flipping the coin and you have an, an infinite gain but versus a very small loss, then it would still be a game that you want to play generally uh, would be the idea, right? And this would be the extreme concept of that because you have infinite gain, right? So, so if you apply that into the expected value formula, then the choice is clear from a logical standpoint would be the idea. And the logic is sound. We'll look at the arguments against this in a second. So believing in God leads to potentially infinite gain if God exists, while the loss, uh, if God does not exist, is finite and relatively minor. Avoiding infinite loss, not believing in God uh, risks infinite loss if God does not exist, which is far worse than any finite gain from not believing. Okay, so here's the criticism against it. Now, I just want to note that the criticism doesn't have anything to do with the structure of the logic, which is sound. It's so sound that it's our core concept that we use all the time in probability, which is the expected value calculation. But I just want to go over some of the criticisms. So criticisms and uh, counter arguments. Pascal's wager has been subject to various criticisms and uh, counter arguments over the centuries. So one of the big ones usually comes up, you probably heard this. So, so I think I heard this on The Simpsons and what, when I was growing up, The Simpsons always talked about some of this weird stuff, but many gods objection. So the wager assumes a specific conception of God, usually the Christian God. Critics argue that there are many possible gods with different requirements for belief and behavior, uh, complicating the decision matrix. So they're basically saying, well, no, it's not a 50-50 choice between either God or no God, because you could use the pagan gods, you can have the the, the Roman gods, the, the Celtic gods, or, or Buddhism versus Hinduism versus different, and so on and so forth. Uh, so, and, and if you pick one god, you're angering all the other gods, is the argument. Now, I don't think that's completely sound here, because I think a lot of, most, many, much of the world is basically governed by some major religions, and, and even if it's not within some of the three, like, uh, Judaic Christian or, or Muslim religions that have kind of a core foundation, uh, I still think many of the concepts related to to God would be kind of similar. So you can get into arguments about how similar are religions and so on and so forth. But there's that one. Authenticity of belief. So genuine belief cannot be based solely on a cost-benefit analysis. And I think this is the one that makes the most sense to, to most people. When I hear this argument, it's like, wow, you can't believe something just purely out of self, 
a gratification of your own gain from it, that doesn't seem like the proper grounding uh, of of belief. You, you might argue that that it's natural for us to want to be to to to, to want the best for ourselves and whatnot and so on. But that seems to me to be the the major basis. It's not really actually proving God exists or not. It's based on solely self-interest, which seems not to be the basis that to make the decision. So Pascal himself acknowledged that belief might not require more than rational calculation. Moral integrity, some argue that it is uh, that it is morally uh, questionable to believe in God merely as a bet rather than out of genuine faith or or conviction. So again, it seems that it's out of self-interest as opposed to what the evidence points to, even though we don't have evidence that can point specifically to existence or non-existence because it's, you know, it's impossible. So assumption of infinite gain and loss, the wager assumes that the rewards and punishments are infinite, which may not align uh, with all theological views. Okay, so those are the arguments again. In general, though, the concept is sound as we apply it in terms of uh, probability, meaning that if you're thinking about something like, like investing or expected value of a game or something, you might have a couple things we consider. Number one being the odds of the outcome of the game, but number two is, is going to be the potential payoff versus the loss depending on those outcomes. All right. So experimentation, this becomes important within experimentation because remember that it used to be that we learned stuff by going back to the ancients. Aristotle said it, it's true. It's, it's the theologians are saying that that's, that's the way it is. Thomas Aquinas said it and so whatever. But, and then they went into looking uh, and using the scientific method to try, to try to say, if I know something about a smaller population of things, for example, can I apply it more, more generally? And that's gonna be dealing with experimentation and probability. These concepts will help us construct these scientific arguments as well as give us some level of security or confidence about the results. So a procedure that can be infinitely repeated uh, and has a well-defined set of possible outcomes. For example, rolling a die or flipping a coin. So when we roll a die or flip a coin, you can think of the population being an infinite roll of die or an infinite flipping of the coin. We only have a finite sample of how many times we flip the coin, but can our sample tell us something about the, the, the entire population. That's what we're trying to do. And how confident can we be about what it tells us? Sample space, sometimes represented with an S, the set of all possible outcomes of an experiment for a six uh, sided die, the sample space is. So one concept we want to keep in mind is what is the sample space? If you have a dice, one dice, the outcome is numbers one through six. And then uh, the sample, the event, so a subset of sample space, it can consist of one or more outcomes. So if we have a dice, then we might say that the event that we're looking for is a four. So if I roll the dice, I'm looking for a four, or we can have more than one outcomes that could be the event saying they're all, I'm looking for even numbers versus the odd numbers on the rules. Probability of an event could be called P of E, so the measure of the likelihood that an event will occur is calculated by dividing the number of favorable outcomes by the total number uh, of possible outcomes. So if all outcomes are equally likely, the probability P of E is given by the formula. P of E is the number of favorable outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. So in other words, if we're looking at our dice situation and we want to pick a number four, that's the favorable outcome. It would just be the one outcome divided by the number of possible outcomes. There are six numbers on the dice, one divided by six. I could also take the even numbers. So the two, four, six, three even numbers divided by the total number of possible six. If the die was not even, it's weighted, it lies more often on one side than the other, then we can't use that simple calculation. We would probably have to use repetition to determine the likelihood of the die landing on any particular number if it's not an even amount, which we'll talk more about in our examples. Complement of an event. So the set of all outcomes in the sample space that are not in the event. So the probability of the complement is one minus the probability of the event. 
So in other words, uh, if we have a coin, uh, I'm sorry, the dice situation, and we're trying to choose a four, that's the event we're looking for. The likelihood of it happening, if the dice is even, is one divided by six, because there's one number out of six. That means the likelihood of it not being happening, which is going to be the complement, is going to be five numbers out of the six. Notice that the complement and the event, the, the probabilities have to add up to 100%. And that gives us kind of like a double check, kind of like the double entry accounting system and internal control if you're looking at it from an accounting standpoint, right? So independent events, what does that mean? So two events are independent if the occurrence of one does not affect the occurrence of the other. For example, flipping a coin and rolling a die are independent events. So for example here, if I'm trying to determine if this batter is gonna hit the ball and whether or not this surfer is going to catch a wave, they're completely independent. Whether or not this batter hits the ball does not depend on whether or not the surfer catches a wave. It might look like it is sometimes due to funny correlations, just out of probability, out of weird circumstance, but they are independent in nature. If I was to try to calculate the probability of the hitting the ball or catching the wave based on the other one, that would be not a wise thing to do because they're not related. They are independent. What about dependent events? There's some kind of dependency between the events. Two events are dependent if the occurrence of one affects the occurrence of the other. For example, drawing cards from a deck without replacement. So for example, if you're playing, and, I, and I'm going to be using games of chance as examples, not because I'm promoting gambling, but rather because these games of chance are built directly on concepts of probability and therefore are perfect testing grounds to test those concepts, which can then be applied to, to many other areas. So if you're looking at, say, blackjack, uh, for example, you're trying to get up to 21. Now, oftentimes they have five decks that they're dealing from the dealer, but let's imagine they just have one deck with 52 cards in it. As you see a card come up, if the card is an ace, then of course the next card that comes up is less likely to be an ace because there's only four aces in the deck. So now you only have three aces in the deck out of not 52 cards, but uh, 51 cards if it was the second card coming out of the deck. So when you deal with any game like that, then the next event is going to be dependent to some degree on the prior event, which is the basis of basically trying to do card counting and stuff like that with regards to card games. Mutually exclusive events. So two events are mutually exclusive if they cannot occur at the same time. For example, rolling a three and rolling a five on a single die roll are mutually exclusive. You can't roll one die and get a three and a five. You can't flip one coin and get both a heads and a tail because those are mutually exclusive events by definition. So addition rule. So for mutually exclusive events, the probability that one or the other occurs uh, is the sum of their individual probabilities. So P of A or B is P of A plus P of B. So if I look at the probability of this guy hitting the ball, and the probability of this person catching the wave, if I'm looking at the probability of either one of them happening, not both of them having to happen, but either one happening, I can add the probabilities up. However, remember that when I look at this or statement, it's a little bit confusing because it's like, are you talking about uh, th what if they both what if they both happen? Is that included or not? Is it an inclusive or exclusive or? Typically, we're talking inclusive. So in other words, we're looking at basically this person hits the ball or this, and you might think of it as and or, this person hits the ball and or, right? This person catches the wave. They can both happen as well or either one of them can happen. Uh, multiplication rule. For independent events, the probability that both occur is the product of their individual properties. So now we're thinking about them both happening. So both of them are, go are, are going to be happening. We're not talking about an or situation. That means the probability is going to be less, not greater. If I'm looking at this happening or that happening, we add them, making the probability, the likelihood higher. If we're talking about two things that both have to happen, meaning both of these dice, for example, have to be a four, 
well, well, now the probability of the first die is one six, the probability of the second die is one six, and I'm not gonna add those together because it's less likely that they both end up to be a four. If you multiply percentages or decimals, you get what, to a number decimal or percent that is lower, and that's what happens here. So P of A and B equals P of A times P of B. All right, the expected value or expecta expectation mean. So the average outcome of a random uh, variable over many trials, it provides a measure of the center of the distribution of uh, the variables. This is the core concept in like casino games and investing in many areas of uh, probability. And the idea of, of course is gonna be, I can't see what I'm go what's gonna happen in one role of the roulette wheel here, for example, but I can predict some, some with, certain, with some certainty if I was to repeat that over a long period of time, which gives us basically our uh, expected value. Now, when we're looking at, say, investment or in a casino game, a couple things to take into consideration, as we saw with Pascal's wager, one being the likelihood, the odds of something happening, and, uh, and number two, what's the payout matrix that's happening? What's it gonna cost versus the benefit if the event happens? So the central limit theorem, CLT, it states that given a sufficiently large sample size, the distribution of the sample mean will approximate a normal distribution, otherwise known as a Gaussian distribution, regardless of the shape of the original population distribution. So we'll take a look at some examples to get an idea of this concept. This concept is a core concept when we do like inductive reasoning, looking at a sample that we're trying to basically apply and see if we can take those characteristics, making assumptions about a larger population and trying to get some certainty or determine how much certainty we have about the assumptions we make. Central limit theorem explained key points. So sample size, the theorem applies to sample size that are sufficiently large. Although there is no strict rule, a common rule of thumb is that a sample size of 30 or more is typically enough for the CLT to hold the central limit theorem. That is independence. The samples must be independent. This means that the selection of one sample should not influence the selection of another. We'll talk about these concepts in future presentations or sections identically distributed the samples uh, should be drawn from the same distribution which has a finite mean and variance a uh, distribution of the sample mean as the sample size n increases the distribution of the sample mean which is x bar approaches a normal distribution the bell curve with a mean often represented with a mu the mean of the population